Welcome to our In Focus discussion tonight on the 20th anniversary of 9-11, the day when 19 militants of Al-Qaeda carried out the deadliest series of coordinated terrorist attacks in world history on the U.S. Nearly 3,000 people died, with an additional 25,000 who were injured. Even two decades later, the impacts of that tragic day are still being felt, experienced, and lived to this very day. In our first conversation, we will talk about the residual effects faced by first responders who were there at Ground Zero. Joining us now live via Zoom is Jeff Dill, founder and CEO of the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance. Jeff, thank you so much for spending your Friday night with us. Welcome back to the show. Let's start with the data. We know that nearly 3,000 people died in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. How many were first responders and do we know how many survive or are living with the life-changing impacts to this day? Well, it's, we, it's a well-known fact that 343 FDNY firefighters lost their lives that day, plus numerous uh, officers from the Port Authority and the police department, the, the uh, New York police. Uh, but what we don't know is, you know, the amount of survivors, because as was in Richard's report, there, there was thousands of first responders that went to the pile to help out FDNY. And so that is, is pretty difficult to gauge. Uh, but we, what we do know is that, and from our data, since we, we're the only organization in the United States that collects and validates fire and EMS suicides, we've been doing that for 11 years, is that the impact has been detrimental to many across the United States that are at their pile, meaning that uh, not only the physical aspect of you know, cancer, dying from cancer, but the mental health where numerous uh, have taken their lives because of that. Now, you say that cultural brainwashing plays a role in how firefighters and EMS deal with emotional issues. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, it's a, a term I coined many years ago. Uh, cultural brainwashing means is that we put this uniform on, this is how we are expected to act. And that's brave, strong, courageous, give help, don't ask for help, I handle all issues on my own. And when you're challenged in your personal, professional um, life uh, regarding issues such as depression or relationship issues, addictions, the job from what we see and do, and we're expected to handle it on our own, it becomes virtually impossible. And so therefore we see so many of our brothers and sisters struggle with these issues. And who expect us to act that way? Well, our brothers and sisters we work with in the firehouses, the communities we serve, as well as the traditions of the fire service. So it's, uh, it, and when we look at it also, society is culturally brainwashed because if I was to ask you, Rosie, uh, when you hear the term firefighter, what words come to your mind? And it would be very uh, like everyone else, brave, courageous, heroic. And so to live up to those expectations is, is very difficult. And I love what your organization does is that, you know, we don't have to disconnect brave, courageous with mental health, right? Or vulnerability, like those things can go hand in hand. They don't have to be separate. Now we know that suicide has been a big concern among first responder mental health. Why do some firefighters choose to take their own lives? Well, our, our data, I have validated 1,657 of these tragic events, and I still unfortunately have 11 more to validate for 2011 that have come in over the last couple of weeks. But when we look at our data, and I validate it by when we get confidential reports, I contact the chief officers of the departments. And so I've personally spoken to about 1,620 chiefs to collect this data. And the number one known reason is marital and family relationships. And, uh, and people want to say it's PTSD, and it absolutely plays a role. But the, the marital uh, relationships, because of the way that we're supposed to act, be strong, brave, don't talk about things, it, it, it becomes a detriment. And at times, unfortunately, we bring our anger to, the, uh, to home. Now, Jeff, what is internal size up, and why should every firefighter do that on a daily basis? Internal size up, once again, is a phrase I coined. What it means simply is that we need to ask ourselves on a daily basis, why am I acting this way? Why am I feeling this way? And to listen to others because they see us a lot better than we will ever see ourselves. So we have to learn to listen to our support at home as well as our brothers and sisters we work with, trying to understand our emotions on a daily basis. And Jeff, as someone who works on the betterment of first responder mental health, 
How are you reflecting today on the 20th anniversary of 9-11? Uh, like everyone else, uh, I was on shift that day. Uh, I worked for a department outside of Chicago and uh, it just it amazes me how that's been 20 years and yet uh, it still seems like yesterday for my brothers and sisters uh, that, that we saw and struggled and for our 343 that lost their lives uh, i will always remember you've been hearing from jeff dill founder and ceo of the firefighter behavioral health alliance jeff thank you for being a part of our conversation tonight we appreciate you so much it was my pleasure and my honor to be here rosie we'll be right back Thank you for staying with us for our second In Focus discussion tonight on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. In this segment, we want to talk about the loved ones left behind in the aftermath of 9-11. In 2018, Utah National Guard Major Brent Taylor, who is also the mayor of North Ogden, was killed by an insider attack while on tour of duty in Afghanistan. He left behind seven children with his widow, Jenny Taylor, who joins us live via Zoom tonight. And Jenny, I know it's been a busy week for you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We'd like to start with how you're reflecting on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. How would you say 9-11 shaped the course of you and your family's life? You know, Rosie, the, the events of 9-11 in 2001 have affected not only my life, but my children's life, my grandchildren for generations to come. I was actually serving an LDS mission outside of the country in 2001 when 9-11 happened. And I always thought that I'd missed out, that there was this great defining moment of patriotism for my generation and I wasn't even here. But about 10 years into my marriage, I realized how that day had shaped my, my life because I ended up marrying a soldier who largely joined the military because of what happened on 9-11. He of course went to war because of what happened on 9-11. And now he has given his life in Afghanistan because of what happened on 9-11. So it's, it shapes every day of my life, every day of my children's life. Uh, their children someday will hear great stories about the grandfather they never knew. So it's a very defining moment that continues to define our future as well. As a community, we all still feel the immense weight from the loss of your husband who gave the ultimate sacrifice for our country three years ago. How are you and your family doing now? I see my kids are doing great. They are so resilient. They're tough little kids. Sometimes they're a little bit snarky and a little bit silly like kids are. And you know, I don't know how to raise teenagers any better than any other parent, but we have been so loved by our community, by neighbors, by friends, by perfect strangers. And it's been a really beautiful thing that's come out of this tragedy is the way we've had people come together and be in my children's life, be in my life. If it weren't for the wonderful people around us, we wouldn't even be standing on our feet every day. No, oh, we're so glad that you know that you and your family are dearly loved. How do you want the public to think about Major Taylor and the legacy he leaves behind? I love that you talk about legacy and it, you know, we can talk about Brent's legacy. We could talk about George Washington's legacy. We could talk about all these kinds of legacies. I would hope we each start to think about what kind of legacy we're creating. There've been a lot of wonderful people who've gone before us who've either died in combat or been willing to give their life for our freedom. What kind of legacy are we carrying on? For me, Brent was a leader. He was a, he was a service oriented leader. He was a statesman. He loved this country. But you know, really for me and my kids, he was my husband. He was my sweetheart. He was their father. He was just an everyday guy that liked circus peanuts for crying out loud. And so I think as we think about the legacy of these wonderful people that have either died in 9-11 or since or in these wars or, or EMTs that run into the burning building every day, I hope it's a time for us to also reflect on what our legacy will be. And our legacy might seem little to us, but we have no idea the impact that our little actions can have in our own communities and then eventually in the world around us. Well said. I can see why Brent fell in love with you. You're just amazing. <laughs> Jenny, what, oh, were thanks, your, <laughs> what were your thoughts and feelings when you heard President Biden announce that he would withdraw all U.S. troops from Afghanistan this past month and end the nearly 20-year war on terror? I just think every other Gold Star family and probably most of America, we've been holding our breath. We've been sick to our stomachs. We've been devastated and heartbroken. It's been a rough few weeks to see what's happening around the world. Uh, you know, we're, we're watching this unfold right before our eyes because of technology. It lets us see everything, the devastation. So my heart goes out to our service men and women who have been there through these last few battles, the men and women who are still trying to get out of there. And my heart really goes out to the Afghan people. You know, my husband and so many of our military men and women 
love the Afghan people. They served with them. They served for them. And so my heart aches not only on the American side, but on the Afghan side as well. And most importantly, Jenny, can you tell us about the Weber 9-11 Project immersive museum exhibit that your foundation and partners have been working on? Yes, I hope everybody will come up to Ogden. I know we're a little off the beaten path, but at the Weber County Fairgrounds, we have a free exhibit. We've taken photo, video, audio, and then real life people and created something where you really get immersed in the in what happened on 9-11, but also that spirit of America. We've got firefighters, police officers, military, medical professionals. We want you to come and see the photos, watch the videos, and then we want you to interact with the firefighter. Come talk to the soldier, come climb in the Humvee or on the ladder of the fire truck. We really want to build an opportunity to interact, to think, to express gratitude, not only to what happened 20 years ago, but what those brave men and women in those different professions continue to do every day. So we're open tonight. We're open tomorrow until eight. Come bring your family, bring your friends. Again, free admission, a great educational, immersive experience. It will change your life. And I promise I'm not just over promising and under delivering. Oh, we would never think that you're over promising and under delivering. You're incredible. <laughs> Jenny, final words. What's your message to the public tonight as they're thinking about 9-11 and the war in Afghanistan? I think my final message is we just need to come together. There are families really grieving around our country because of someone they lost 20 years ago or someone they've lost in the 20 years since or because of the chaos and the turmoil. Let's set aside politics. Let's set aside our differences. Let's focus on what unites us. I keep saying stop pointing fingers and start asking yourself some pointed questions. And the most simple question is, what's my part? What can I do? I live in a small town in northern Utah, but I can still do something. And if each of us would do something, think of the difference that would make, not just on 9-11, but every day. You've been hearing from Jenny Taylor, the widow of Major Brent Taylor. Jenny, you are amazing and we loved hearing from you. <laughs> Thank you and best wishes Thanks, to your event this weekend. Welcome to our third In Focus discussion tonight on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. The events of 9-11 also severely impacted the lives of Muslim Americans who are still experiencing the residual effects to this day. Rounding out our conversation tonight are Satine Tajnizi and Nora Abudan, the co-founders of the Emerald Project. Ladies, thank you so much for being here tonight and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having us, Rosie. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. We'll start this conversation with you, Satine. Where were you or what were you doing when 9-11 happened? Um, well, Rosie, I was six years old in Stockton, California. My dad burst into my room where my mom was actually with me and said they got the Twin Towers. Um, the Twin Towers fell, they were attacked. And we came out into the living room and all I remember is my mom crying while we were watching the TV. And Nora, what about you? Do you remember where you were when 9-11 was happening? Yeah, definitely. I was a little bit older. I was in third grade. I was around nine years old and I wasn't in school that day, but I remember my dad was doing business on the East Coast and my mom was freaking out and crying and I didn't really understand the impact of what had just happened. I just saw footage playing over and over again on the TV mm -hmm. that said, you know, red alert and that the Twin Towers had fallen and my dad didn't know when he was going to be able to come back because all the flights were grounded. Satine, so, how did you feel when you saw the footage of the Twin Towers falling and heard the news? Uh, well, Rosie, for one, I was scared. I was six years old, so seeing your country attacked at that age is, is frightening, and, and at the time, we didn't know what was going to happen next. Um, on some level, as an American, I was afraid and grieving, but on another level, hearing the conversation in the background with my family, who is from Iran, we were mortified of what that meant for our family back home in the Middle East. Was there going to be a war? Would, they, would retaliation happen? And with how much misinformation about who actually hit the Twin Towers. We were scared, what if our family is killed in the crossfire of some war that should have never taken place to begin with? So I felt afraid on two different fronts. So Satine, did things change for you and your family immediately after 9-11 or was it more so once people found out you were Muslim? Um, that's a good question, Rosie. I think on the actual day of 9-11, I was supposed to go to school and my dad didn't let me. I didn't originally understand why. Um, and I asked my mom and she said, he's scared that you're gonna get bullied or harassed at school. And I didn't really understand what that, what, um, what I had to do with 9-11. Why would they single me out? And so I think that answer from my mom was the very first time 
um, it occurred to me that that people are going to see me in a way that that isn't a reflection of who I am or who my family is. Um, as far as like what happened to our family with time, you know, we're Iranian American. Um, our family has nothing to do with um, Al Qaeda. Iran has nothing to do with Al Qaeda, and yet the FBI still came and investigated our family because um, a neighbor actually called and said they were worried we were terrorists. So it's you know it's the little things and the big things that really shaped shaped the aftermath of 9/11 for us. I'm sorry to hear about what you went through. Nora, what does the word terrorist mean to you before 9-11? Did you hear the term often and then what did it mean to you after 9-11? Yeah, so as a third grader, I hadn't heard the word terrorist, I would say, often or probably ever. But after 9-11, I would hear it very often. Kids would joke about it. I was grateful that I never actually got physically hurt for being Muslim and for being who I am, but I would constantly be called terrorist. My mom would be called a raghead, and my dad would be called a terrorist. People would constantly say like, oh, how's your Uncle Osama doing? So this may seem like harmless bullying, but over the years, it really gets to you because even when I was 16 years old in my math class, I had a substitute teacher who just kept staring at me during class, and I was like, oh, you know, is there something that you need from me? And he was like, no, you just remind me of the people that I kill in Iraq, and I'm happy to do it, and it's nothing against you, but I hate you and I hate your kind. And he singled me out in front of everyone in the class, and I was kind of, I was shocked because I had never heard that kind of direct verbal attack on me before, and I was just 16 years old, and no one in class stood up for me, so I just remained quiet, and all I could say was, you know, I'm sorry for what he experienced, but we're not all terrorists, and people are using Islam in the name of terrorism, but that's not what Islam and Muslims are. Those experiences are traumatizing, and it's so devastating to hear what you two have gone through, and I hope you know that those experiences, like, you know, are not small, are not insignificant, like, those incidents are not okay. Now, we have to take a quick break, so Nora and Satine hold that thought. When we return, we'll resume our In Focus discussion on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Welcome to our fourth and final In Focus discussion tonight on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. We pick up our conversation now with Satine Tashnizi and Nora Abu Dan, the co-founders of the Emerald Project. We'll start with you again, Satine. Do you believe that there is a solution to terrorism, and if so, what is it? Absolutely, there's a solution to terrorism if we have the discipline and courage to address terrorism for the problem that it is. Um, the first step to, to solving for terrorism is accurate information. Um, terrorism thrives on legitimacy. Um, ter terrorism needs legitimacy to, to exist and they use Islam to legitimize their, their political agenda. Every time we equate Islam with terrorism, we advance the terrorist agenda. So for me, like when President Trump decided to ban Muslims as a solution to terrorism, in my mind I was shocked because um, claiming that a ban on Muslims would somehow solve what happened on 9-11 gives those terrorist organizations the credibility they need to thrive and grow. We have to be committed to accurate information. We have to um, understand what the difference between those political ideologies and the religion Islam is. A lot of what happened on 9-11 di directly contradicts our Islamic principles. And until we can understand what Islam is and what the ideology that fuels terrorism is, we cannot move forward. Very interesting perspective. Thank you for sharing that. Nora, let's turn to you now. How did 9-11 shape your identity? Um, it shaped it in a lot of ways. I feel like it was a very vulnerable age to have 9-11 happen. I was very confused. I didn't understand what was going on, but I had to live with it for the rest of my life. And to this day, as Satine touched upon, the Muslim ban happened. and. Even experiences before then, I had my mom who was working at Salt Lake International Airport. It's before TSA came around and she would do boarding pass checks. So she was actually trying to keep flights safe. She was trying to keep everyone that was in the airport safe to make sure that everyone had their credentials okay. And she had someone who was her superior come up to her and say, uh, you're a Palestinian Hamas terrorist. 
number one, Hamas had nothing to do with the terrorist attack that happened on 9-11. And second of all, my mom was actually trying to keep passengers safe. And for her superior to say that to her, to see her come home and to see her crying and saying, why do they single me out? Why will people not give me their boarding pass because I wear the hijab or the headscarf? It really does shape your identity and you feel you feel singled out for the wrong reasons. I don't feel like people truly see me for as, as a Muslim and for the principles that Islam truly teaches. I think that they truly do equate terrorism with Islam and that's not correct. It has gotten better over the years, but I still think we have a lot of work to do. And that's how my identity is founded. I need to make sure that I am being a good representative as a Muslim and showing that those terrorists have nothing to do with us. And no one should have to live like that. I'm sorry to hear about what your family went through. Ladies, we have to wrap soon, but two more questions I want to squeeze in. Satine, what is a consequence of 9-11 that people usually don't talk about? Or what's something that you want viewers to know tonight about Muslims and Islam? I think there's two consequences that are very underrated. The first is after 9-11, the amount of misinformation about Islam and Muslims that flooded our airwaves, whether that's textbooks or news, news stations or um, even just like pop culture and media, the amount of misinformation that flowed into the ears of the American public actually created more terrorism. It, it legitimized more terrorist organizations. Imagine if every time we talked about the KKK, we referred to it as a Christian organization. We don't do that because we will not permit the KKK to benefit from that kind of legitimacy. And at the same time, an organization like the KKK contradicts the principles of Christianity. So I think the amount of legitimization that happened of terrorism after 9-11 is very underrated. And if we want to address um, our national security issues in a, in, a, in, a, like in a serious light, we need to address that. The second piece I think that's a major consequence is who, the way that we react to post 9-11 America will define what our flag is and who we are as Americans and who we are as a country. The, if we're going to demonize Muslims, if we're going to say we have to ban Muslims to prevent from another 9-11 from happening, the way that Muslims are depicted on, on news stations and in media, um, I don't care how afraid that you might feel, but at the end of the day, that is a reflection of what this country is. We celebrate America for its diversity and inclusivity um, and its democratic values, but in reality, the more that we demonize a group of people because of their religious beliefs and discount facts, um, and given to fears. Satine, and I'm sorry, we are out of time. I have to oh. cut you off. And I know oh. that the Emerald Project has an event tomorrow. We will post all the details online. But thank you again, ladies, for joining us tonight. You've been hearing from Satine Tajnizi and Nora Abudan of the Emerald Project. We appreciate you so much, and we'll be right back. <laughs>